them. And uh, I, that, that kind of area of things is kind of just a sweet spot for me in general. I'm a computer geek by trade, so I'm more on the hacker side of things. But here recently, I've gotten much more involved in seeing what you can do with all the information that's out there and available on the network now. And um, so then kind of the journalism and the investigative journalism part of it all has been more and more interest to me here uh, over the years. So this sits a, a very nice spot. I've always been interested in hackers and hacking and that sort of thing as well. So uh, naturally, it's just sort of an area that has captivated my attention. So what I wanted to do tonight was to start just taking a look at this phenomenon, which has a pretty old history in a lot of ways, um, but has changed in some sense by our increasingly um, digitized world, in some ways, I guess you could say. Um, the nature of moving information into digital form has made it much more fluid, and as a result, um, the or the possibility for these kinds of document leaks has, has increased um, as, our, as we're all more interconnected and as our information is more and more digitized. Um, you know, that's, it's just a phenomenon that's going to be happening more and more, perhaps. We'll talk about that more as well. Um, I actually went ahead and just looked up the actual phrase document dump on Wikipedia, and I thought it was kind of interesting because it was was phrased from a point of view that was um, actually more influenced by the, the legal field in some ways, and was referring to the practice that was often um, a practice of, of sharing information, or generally it sounds kind of reluctantly sharing information. Um, I wanted to highlight this here because it emphasizes that there is a sometimes adversarial relationship between folks that are interested in acquiring information and the folks that have the information that um, is sought after. And this particular entry highlights that there's sometimes um, uh, roadblocks, I guess you could say, or speed bumps that are put in the way of actually acquiring information. And so that informed in some sense the criteria that I wanted to look at um, by looking at across a few different examples of document dumps um, across, I guess, the last 40 years or so. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about each of these particular criteria I chose, which in some ways are kind of arbitrary. You know, I don't know how much these criteria are actually going to tell you anything about the actual document dumps themselves, because each one is going to be very, very particular. And, but these are some sort of patterns that we can observe criteria that we can analyze each of the notes and see if that reveals anything or provides some guidance to us. So the first criteria I wanted to look at is this question of the spectrum of secrecy. Um, and by that phrase, I mean information that is sought after is going to be more or less constrained by the owner of that information, I guess that's a, a phrase we could use. Um, just to take the example of, um, say, information that's um, held by a government, um, there are going to be, there's going to be a classification system that's in place within that government, and depending on the level of classification or where it's at on that spectrum of secrecy, um, there's going to be uh, different constraints on that information and different constraints on its distribution. So, uh, but that also pertains to just personal data like you and I. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's this question of how secret information that you and I have uh, is, is held because we've been seeing recently quite a few spates of the public release of private information or, people, or information that people were assuming was private uh, in the custodian under the responsibility or custodianship of particular organizations. So that's one of the criteria. One of the other criteria is uh, the quantity of information. And this becomes useful in terms of seeing, well, 
uh, the metaphor that comes ready to hand is whether you're looking for a needle in a haystack. And that's very often the situation when we're looking at these massive document dumps. You know, the, the actual quantity of information itself becomes a um, constraint on one's ability to actually navigate it and to, to find the information that you're looking for. Um, the quality of information, I mean, a couple of different things by that. Um, certainly, the quantity and quality relationship is, is, uh, is one that I've just repeatedly come back to in my life, um, seeing how if you have a sufficient quantity of things, then somehow the actual quality of the, uh, the uh, there's actually a qualitative change in your relationship to that information. Um, and I'm also referring to the actual physical form of the information as it's presented. So the quality of the information might refer to, um, say, if you just got a bunch of, well, say, for instance, to use a example that we don't go into because it doesn't really matter, Sarah Palin email dump, 25,000 pages of email that were presented to people in boxes. I said, OK, well, here you go. Here's your, here's your open records request. Have fun. So that becomes a, a question in terms of the usefulness of the information. And then last, the intentionality of the release, whether there was an intention to release that information to the public or what that, what that relationship is. So for instance, um, in the case of a whistleblower, that is an intentional release from a secret and constrained environment out to the public. Um, whereas we'll see a couple of other cases where that information was not intentionally released. So let's go ahead and dive in. We're gonna look at about five different cases. So I'll just look at a couple of different examples. So first off, I wanted to start with a classical whistleblowing case. Um, and this one is kind of kind of the canonical reference in a lot of ways to the act of whistleblowing. It's Daniel Ellsberg release of what's come to be known as the Pending Up Papers. Um, originally tried to release it in 1969, and uh, he released it actually to the, in 1969, he photocopied this document, which is actually a top secret um, document that he worked on starting in 1967 for Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, um, looking at the history of decision making in Vietnam from 1945 to 1968. And so this was a document that was not even shared with the President, is my understanding. And so very, very high levels of secrecy involved with that. Um, so Ellsberg had a, uh, a, a, um, a moment of conscience, I guess you could say, is one way to put it, and decided that he was no longer content um, with this information being withheld from the American people, and went through a process of actually photocopying this 7,000 page, 7, pages of documents by hand. It's a, it's a really a, an interesting story. Um, and so, he attempted to release it in 69 to the, foreign, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and then not getting enough pickup at that point in 1971, so several years later, he eventually released it to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and 17 other papers. And that's when um, a really, really actual beautiful moment for the mainstream media occurred at that point. So anyhow, um, Mr. Ellsberg, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's actually continued to be very much a, an open advocate and um, uh, an activist on really focusing on nuclear topics or, or questions of nuclear proliferation and nuclear energy in the 70s and has recently become involved, or at least he was earlier this year, um, early in 2010, uh, defending WikiLeaks for, for their actions. So. He's on Twitter as well, if you want Daniel Ellsberg. His son's involved with, uh, his, uh, his son's helping out with his, his activism and activities. And if you're interested in actually finding out more about that story, this is a good film about it. It's called The Most Dangerous Man in America. Uh, it was released several years ago. Was that on PBS recently? I uh, saw a whole thing on him on PBS recently. So. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. He's been, be he's been taking, he's been, uh, remarkably um, 
vital uh, force and influence in this realm. And uh, just, you know, just speaks from an unimpeachable place, which is not what you could say for how uh, Nixon was impeached as a result of some of these documents. So that's one classical example. Um, another kind of example I wanted to bring up is um, going through the process of filing open records requests or uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. And I wanted to use the example, I'm sad Ken couldn't be here tonight. Um, so Ken Martin runs the Austin Bulldog, which is a small investigative journalism outfit here in town that's been uh, active for the last about year and a half, I think. And so he's had a couple of instances where he's been working with the city of Austin and has been doing some uh, calling them to account on their adherence to open meetings um, law within the state and has actually had pretty good success in um, affecting change um, as a result of some of the, the activities that he's pursued. So um, this particular example is one where he actually filed an open records request and acquired back nearly 5,000 pages worth of emails from members of our uh, city council and was able to actually go through and track down the information they were looking for at that time. Um, so there's a few things that I wanted to highlight here. You know, this is a, um, it's a public records request, so it, it's, uh, it has to be respected in some sense. It's within the law of the state uh, that you can file these open records requests and receive back documents within a reasonable amount of time. I'm not sure about the exact language and all of that. Um, I have not actually gone through the process of filing any open records requests uh, myself as of yet. But um, so in this case, there's sometimes, uh, we mentioned earlier, the fact that there's sometimes this adversarial relationship set up uh, because very often the people who are wanting the information are wanting the information because they believe that there is some wrongdoing um, that will be documented within the information that they're requesting. And so naturally the folks who have that information are maybe not necessarily really excited about sharing that. And so these uh, types of speed bumps will be put up in place. In this instance, um, the Austin Bulldog actually filed a lawsuit to um, expedite the process of acquiring this information. Um, has been successful, and in fact, they've actually uh, recently done the same exact thing here. So again, another instance here where uh, they were provided with image PDFs um, and had to go through a process of actually converting those to text PDFs to make them searchable, and then also um, they actually instantiated a uh, crowdsourcing uh, process with this information as well to, to get the public's help to actually go through all this information. It's interesting. Um, when we got this document, uh, the statesman got them, got some of them too, and we were able to run them through Document Cloud, you know, for the, for the the um, to convert to text, and, and that gives you some, as a reporter, some some tools in order to analyze them. And so you think, okay, the PDF, you know, is the worst way you can get it, and you got it. Well, we follow similar requests with the county. And what they did instead is give us access to their email system. Actually created an email account where you went into that system and they copied the, the relevant emails into that system. But guess what? You can't search across them. There was no way to search across them and, and they weren't going to provide them in a, in a way that we could print them or, or, uh, or export them. And so it was almost, it was kind of funny, you would think, oh, you got them in a digital way, their native format, and it would be better, but it was actually harder to deal with those emails and it was Could getting them in the media. Could you set up a pop account? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you just pull them down. Like you, just you could pull them into an inbox. Were, it, it was like a, a web interface for most of us. It was. It was. You really want to search them. Yeah. yeah well, we didn't. I mean, we couldn't even get them that way. Right. I mean, it, it was a very locked down email system where you could get into. It was like a web version of Lotus Notes. Did you ever solve it? Oh, I, I mean, we, well, yeah. we didn't. So uh, she went through them. We just didn't have a way to get them in the document cloud. That's what it boiled down to. I mean, I, I don't even remember what stories came out of it. It was just interesting how 
we could actually do more with with PDFs. those printed emails than we could with you know, in circumstances yeah. like that, whenever I hear about the fact that there's no direct mechanism that's provided to do import or export, you know, if you've got it up there in a digital form and you're able to bring it up in a browser or something like that, then you can mechanize the process of actually going through it. Talk to a hacker just and make it more yeah. yeah. so it for you. I'll, let's let's turn it on through here. Here's the actual Texas Open Government uh, law that pertains to the, the open records information. So like, that's there if you ever want. Um, Title five, subtitle A, chapter five, five, two, subchapter A. Um, so I would imagine people in this room have done FOA requests. Oh. You? Well, not, right. I've done a couple of FOIA. TPIA. Like the Texas ones, they're, Texas actually is one of the better, better at responding to uh, public information requests. They, I don't know how we, how that worked out. Mm -hmm. like we, so nice. we're, it very, is, it is. we're very responsive here. So, um, it's, it is unusual. Texas is, is widely recognized for having very progressive open records and open meetings laws uh, compared to most states, which is it is it's sort of mind-boggling. Like there's got to be a very interesting history. Yeah. About that, I'm sure. I, I just don't know. It's interesting that you pointed to, we saw to, that are to the law on the um, alleged yeah. website. <laughs> yeah. Because the alleged website <laughs> is also something that's designed for inaccessibility. And if you look at how they do their, their meeting minutes and all that, they haven't. I've tried to go in and scrape it and put it into more of a formatted format, but it's uh, Let me quite challenging because it's not an HTML or anything that you could really go in and pull stuff out so we anyway, it? it's, 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 it's in like word <laughs> with no <laughs> formatting <laughs> consistency <laughs> or anything <laughs> or you can get raw text too which doesn't help a lot either so try this one now what was the bulldog trying to find with that Ooh, real fast uh sunlight foundation has been working on their state level uh open or basically screen scraping systems for mm -hmm interacting with the state governments. And I've been having good success like going over here and quickly like identifying uh, bills and things like that, Sweet. finding the actual text of the bills and okay. we'll voted on what. So, so is it like pre-made scrapers that they're just maintaining kind of thing? Or um, I think well, not well, pre-made, but I mean they've made them and they're maintaining them now. They have started off with the so-called low hanging fruit in terms of the states that they're choosing to um, implement this. With. And so Texas was one of the first. I think they've got about five. Texas has a nice school. FTP site. It's dual. It was doable, but I just looked at it and said it's not like a fun little weekend project. It's a. It's a big hefty effort, and I'm glad the Sunlight Foundation is back. There's there's some people here in town working on that as well, though. There's 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 several efforts around. So that's a good resource. There was another question though before we went into that one. He was asking what the what the Austin Bulldog was looking for. Oh, right, right, right. Um, well, here is some of that information. Um, so, here's one of the, the posts from the Bulldog site uh, where they're saying, I've seen hundreds of pages of email and text message in which city council communicated amongst themselves. So, yes, this is not so much talking about the why, this is talking about how they're moving to actually crowdsource the information, which is an interesting phenomenon in its own right. So again, I, I really wish Ken was here so he could he could provide more accurate background on all this stuff. I've been just sort of following an ancillary, but just- I mean, in essence, he was looking for emails of, of council members who were coming to vote conclusions through email and not in public. Yes. They were coming to a forum <laughs> with their answers in email. Okay, and sometimes with not actual, and if actually, I remember correct, it wasn't even actual city email service as well. Yeah. Like the answer, yeah, the answer, sorry, the answer to your question about what the Bulldog was doing, Yeah. they were they were looking at um, the council members' email back to each other to, to see if they were coming to conclusions or agreeing on votes before, w without discussing it in public. I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, in some cases, right. The e emails back and forth were, were not only in City of Boston emails, but in their own Gmail accounts and things like that. And in some cases, they'd even say, you know, use my personal email. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but nobody got in awesome. trouble, did they? I think they might have they, tried to change some rules, but they didn't get in trouble. And there was a little bit of public embarrassment. That's yeah, it. but they didn't get in trouble, even though it was illegal what they were doing. Well, I, so there has to be. There's. So that's a that's a good point, though. Too, you know, it's a question of well, what is our what is our goal in seeking out this information and bringing it to public attention? And you know, part of part of the time, sometimes that role is just a, a slap on the hand. In some sense, you know, it's a recognition of the fact that. Your constituency is watching you. So they're, they're looking to see what you're up to, and here's your get out of jail free card this one time. But uh, we know how to actually acquire this information. We can do it at any time. So you know that's that's even if it is not there, even if no one is going to spend any sort of time in jail or whatever punishment is regarded as appropriate these days. Um, the fact that. The fact that we're empowered to, to be in this position, to, to keep our elected officials uh, accountable and responsible and within the letter of the law is it's a good place to be. Oh, yeah. So I really liked um, the fact that at one point um, the Bulldog reached out to their readers and said, you know, look, we've got 5,000 pages of emails here and we need to go through it quickly. Um, I think sites like Politico have organized similar things. Like when um, yeah, like they'll get a document done late on Friday I, night. I appreciated their efforts. Similar efforts with Sarah Palin. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Great community effort there. So, and here more recently, um, WikiLeaks actually did a, a real serious call out. Once uh, I don't know if everyone's aware that there's been this entire situation fiasco drama surrounding the release of all of the, the actual uh, State Department cables here in the last two weeks. Um, we'll, go into <coughs> that, we'll go into that at the end. But as part of that process during that, um, they reached out to folks and said, look, here they are. Um, start tagging the stuff that you find on Twitter with the hashtag WLFind. And so that was an easy way to for everyone that was crowdsourcing things to, to stay in communication. You just monitor that tag and just watching the litany of uh, stuff go by. So crowdsourcing, a good tactic in this age of Dr. Dumps. So, and again here highlighting the fact that they went ahead and made everything searchable, that being an important um, step to making it actually useful. Um, let's see, so again, they're on Twitter. Go check them out, Austin Bulldog. Um, next one I wanted to talk about here just came out in the last week. Um, and I called this an instance of collateral damage um, as a result of a document dump. Um, this is a situation in a New York court where two of the aviation companies that were involved in the CIA's extraordinary rendition program were in court fighting it out over $874,000. And as a result, they released 1,700 pages of files uh, that included contracts, they included flight invoices, records of where they were actually flying, and uh, cell phone logs and such. And so this was kind of surprising to everyone that this was permitted to come out. And so definitely a case where it was not an intentional release of information. Um, and the quality, you know, who knows? This all came out on uh, August 31st, and um, we don't really necessarily know what all's in there. Um, so uh, it's also unusual because, well, the secrecy level, that's, that's at the, it's the high secrecy level that you can really think of, I guess black operations from, from the CIA. And so previously there had been another cir circumstance years ago, um, several years ago, from my understanding that the some branch of the United States government stepped in in a court case like this and said, no, I mean, you can't have this information within uh, the public record because uh, we're going to be invoking the state secret privilege. Which, if you haven't 
looked into the state secret privilege and how that was established, I recommend going and checking that out because it's a very interesting story uh, right around World War II um, with a, a pretty shady story from, from what I've been able to get. So really just sort of the, the provenance of that is that privilege is, is a little bit suspect to begin with. So this is the, the group that actually broke it, the story. Um, it's at reprieve.org.uk. And so they're the ones that originally identified the documents being available. Um, here's one of the documents. Um, Richmore Aviation is one of the, uh, one of the um, flight services, uh, transportation, organizations that was uh, contracted. And it's really interesting. I mean, this is just a flight log and a summary of charges. So you can just see here, they took off from DC, landed in Rome, went over to Islamabad, then Dubai, then Glasgow, and back to Washington. Total price tag for that trip was nearly $200,000. I'm not really sure why these organizations are fighting in court over eight hundred and seventy-four thousand dollars in that case, but you know, <laughs> great. So this is a really good Washington Post article that came out uh, the day after uh, that kind of ties everything together. So um, that's a good good place to start if you're interested. One thing that emerged from all of this that was kind of curious uh, that apparently it looks like. The rendition flights may have been flying under the assumption that they had State Department uh, imprimatur for this, and uh, it looks like that may have not been the case, as this particular document shows. They've not been able to actually find this Terry A. Hogan, representative of the State Department. <laughs> and from the documents that they have, that show this sort of a, uh, again, get out of jail free card, I guess, for whenever you're landing in a foreign country with uh, uh, invitees, is the <laughs> phrase that was actually used by these organizations. <laughs> um, so apparently, looking at the documents, the signature is different on the documents. So uh, interesting story there, just kind of emerging. So that's one of those unintentional collateral damage sort of document dumps. So we couldn't have a talk like this without a talk about data liberation, we'll call it that for right now, with uh, the idea of Anonymous and the actual hacking group LulzSec around the movement or idea anti-sec. So how many folks here, what's your familiarity level with Anonymous and all of that stuff that's been going on? I saw the whole, uh, what was it, Friendswood, the, the police department? Which one? The Friendswood police department, was that the latest thing that they? Mm -hmm. That was, uh, that he was, was Bay Area Rapid uh, Transit Police. Okay, all right, um, both of those are um, situations that Anonymous has been directly involved in. Um, the Friends with Police Chief's emails were released um, as part of Texas Takedown Thursday, which was last Thursday, um, hashtag TTT, um, which, which is, there's a lot of collisions on hashtags, so don't want to put too much stuff there. But uh, yeah. This last release on Thursday was the release of 20 Texas police chiefs or high level uh, officers from their email schools and all their attachments uh, were released in the wild um, Thursday um, directly as a stated response to the, um, in the capture and incarceration and charging of uh, anonymous members connected with the ongoing FBI war on this group right now. So that's one example. And anonymous
Thomas has been directly involved in the um, Op Mart uh, situation in San Francisco, which has been very near and dear to, to my heart as well. I've been following all that very closely, certainly like after first broke, but that was a situation where the area rapid transit, their, their metropolitan transit um, organization, which is a, a quasi-government agency, um, actually undertook the steps of, um, well, aside from the fact that they've murdered six people on BART um, for over the last 10 years or so, I think, um, in this circumstance, they got so paranoid about an upcoming protest against the BART police that they took the preemptive step of shutting down cell phone service across eight of the BART stations. Um, it's widely reported as four, but it was eight for three and a half hours in the middle of a rush hour um, a while back. And so that's real problematic from a lot of different angles, um, not the least of which is the fact that it's the first circumstance where we've seen a telecommunications grid shut down in the United States to with the explicit intent of preempting a protest, which is exactly what Mr. Mubarak was uh, guilty of doing in Egypt for the entire country during uh, the January uh, revolution there. So did, it's a very did, bad precedent. Did they also do some denial of service? Attacks. The Nazis has been very busy. Yes, they are been there's very, the, very busy. There's the yeah, the HP Gary one. Yes, yes. Well, associated with WikiLeaks too, right? Website. Like the the companies that failed to support WikiLeaks, they did denial of service attacks on them, right? Yes. Did they do it to pay with a PayPal? One? Yeah, PayPal was yeah. one. Yeah. Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. No, they're quite going to take down Facebook on November sixth, which well, was, we will see. Yeah, there's there's different feelings about that one, yeah. and that that's a good point to, to bring up the fact that anonymous is not a group, right? Definitely not an organized entity of any sort, really at all. Well, not entirely true. There's some sense of organization and some sort of groups that emerge, like LawSec, which by all accounts did emerge from anonymous and then kind of merged back in after their 50 days of lulls. On our, our actions um, across the network. So, but not to get too far into that right now, we can go into that a little bit more later as far as the actual structure. Well, uh, I guess we'll, we'll actually go into it some here. But just looking in aggregate at all of their different document dumps that they've, they've uh, carried out, that's, that's one of their primary tactics that they're using besides this uh, distributed denial of service. Um, attacks to perform a, either, depending on how you look at it, a virtual sit-in on an organization's internet resources or a compromise of the freedom of speech of that organization is another way of looking at that. So it's a very, very interesting tactic. But in addition to that, they very regularly break into servers, acquire information, and release it out to the public. So. Uh, so you're finding everything from private information. So like in the Opbark event, there was a rather unfortunate act undertaken by an overzealous anonymous member to break into the BART, uh, the mybart.org site, which is sort of like a, 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 a mybart.org, you know, it's a, a, a way for an individual to go to the site and get some information or share some information. So they broke into my bar and then they distributed like 2,000 people's personal information addresses and email addresses of just people using BART. And so immediately that kind of was counterproductive really for any sort of organizing, any sort of actual protest or enrolling the hearts and minds of the people of San Francisco behind that cause. So um, that was rather foolish. But it, again, you know, it was just some kid probably did. So, so everything from private information to mid-level classified documents, um, you're definitely seeing. We'll see a couple of examples here of documents that are um, not supposed to be seen by the public. 
public or the media. Um, as far as the quantity, you know, you're seeing everything from single files, CSV files, worked down to the database, to gigabytes of data. Um, I think there's been a, a 10 gigabyte release here fairly recently. Um, thousands of files. The quality of the information, you can see that the anonymous members are just interested in providing the haystacks for the most part. They're not even really necessarily using the information themselves. Uh, that's not true. They're putting the haystacks out there and then it's up to uh, everybody else to actually find anything that's incriminating. It's just sort of assumed uh, that there's going to be something there. Um, some preliminary, generally some preliminary digging is performed and it's pointed out, um, like for instance, in the, this last release of information from Texas police chiefs, uh, they were sure to point out that, oh look, here's, here's a racist email chain that's been forwarded around by this particular police officer, and here's a straight up blatant racist statement uh, from, from this other police chief. So, you know, uh, the, they seem to do enough digging to, to recognize that there's, there's malfeasance there. So, and then last, the intentionality, you know, these organizations, they, nobody would want, nobody would want that. So, some familiar iconography. Um, this is kind of a frequent anonymous logo. This is the, uh, the idea of uh, the headless suit as, uh, as sort of uh, a way of seeing the world, a certain sort of political consciousness there. Um, and this is the mascot of the Lull Sight Group, which uh, has come and gone. And then this is a logo, kind of a combination of the two with the, the Guy Fox mask and the top hat from LulzSec, indicating that the anti-sec um, movement is kind of uh, emerged from their combination and work together. Um, as far as finding out more about these groups, um, I actually just came across this source of information that I thought was kind of interesting, <coughs> not the least of which because of their uh, um, their font style choices on YouTube. Uh, and so go check out that person, um, Anonymous Thought on YouTube. They do a pretty darn good job. And this was from 2008. Did they hack up the page or did you do that? No, no, no. That's, uh, that's how it appears on the YouTube site. I think they just went ahead and modified all the <laughs> font colors and stuff to make it nearly unusable. So um, Wikipedia naturally does a very good job in terms of nerd geek stuff. And so the articles for LulzSec and Anonymous and Operation NSEC are, are very good places to start um, if you want to learn more about the th things they've been up to. Excuse me. Um, here's just an example of some of the releases that they've had here recently. <coughs> and I use that phrase, releases. I think that's a, that's a good phrase. It's used very frequently to refer to document dumps in general. Uh, it's, it's probably more more applicable, really. Uh, so, starting back here in late June, you see there's been releases very steadily up until here, Texas Take Down Thursday, just on the 2nd. So, they've been very, very active. Like, this is, this is just a snapshot of, of one particular user on the Pirate Bay. Um, they're releasing all these documents via torrents. And so that's the that's the, the preferred mechanism for, for tracking down that information. They also have a very very pretty sophisticated way of um, storing this information uh, within the uh, Tor network, and so they're providing uh, interfaces to this information, both secured within the Tor network and for um, I guess public facing web proxies that are that are not as secure. So the information is even browsable on the web. Um, so, but just looking at some of these give you, gives you a sense of their targets, and who they've been targeting, and why the US government is particularly interested in their activities. Um, so, the Ching La Migra releases, which I think means fuck the border police, um, was a release targeted at the Arizona Department of Public Safety, and um, they targeted uh, 
targeted the Arizona DPS in particular for being uh, for the racism that's exhibited and for the the border wars that are going on, and that really I don't get a sense that the American public has really any idea about, um, and especially after actually looking through some of these things and seeing what our law enforcement officials are seeing about the border wars. You know, we don't have the slightest idea about what's going on over there. And it's uh, it's actually it's actually very interesting. Like, I, I wanted to make sure to, to point that out, is that transparency has this weird effect of increasing empathy. So as a result of actually looking at these documents and such, I actually think I have greater empathy for our law enforcement professionals and the challenges that they are facing um, than I would otherwise. Otherwise, I'm just operating on my own, probably ideologically um, uh, motivated uh, or influenced uh, perceptions on what law enforcement is and how they do their work and you know, accentuate the negative or accentuate the positive, however the case may be. So that's one interesting thing about transparency in general that uh, enters into this discussion about the relevance of these document releases. So um, so that's an interesting one. We'll look at a document from the Chingula Negro release here in a second. Um, just to quickly go through some of the other ones to, to emphasize that point. Um, here's the Fucking FBI Friday 2 release, um, targeting IRC Federal, a defense contractor, military meltdown Monday. Booz Allen Hamilton, major contractor, I believe former head of NSA is in charge of them right now. Uh, Mantech, another uh, FBI organization. Shooting Sarah Saturday was when they broke into the Association of Missouri Police Chiefs um, information and released, that was a huge release, about 10 gigabytes. And then Vanguard Defense Industries, and then Texas Takedown again, 20. Texas police chiefs. So not everybody's really excited about LulzSec and the anti-sec movement. Um, you are seeing, um, you're seeing the emergence of grassroots level opposition, uh, to similar other, other hacker groups that are, are moving um, in opposition. Um, this group is a group that calls themselves the, the Web Ninjas and they took their personal mission to be exposing the identities of the actual members of Lull's site. Um, so kind of using those exact same tools of saying, okay, well, we're going to, the phrase is to dox someone to, to reveal their personal private information. So they're going to basically try to dox Lull's site. Um, and then more organized opposition in the form of, uh, well, here's getting to the HB Gary. Uh, Palantir Technologies, Barrico, Barrico Technologies um, partnership called Team Themis that was revealed after H.B. Gary federal CEO Aaron Barr made the very unfortunate um, choice of saying to the Financial Times that he had all this information on the members of Anonymous and was going to reveal it, and as a result, within about, oh, 24, 48 hours, a group from Anonymous had hacked into HB Gary Federal's uh, servers, downloaded the email spools of their CEO and, and Baron Barr, and another another member uh, remotely wiped his iPad. You know, they they just really let all the all the let it go on all barrels on that particular one. And as a result, one of the documents that was revealed after a while, um, because there was so much, again, so much information was released, and then it was only a month and a half later that someone actually found this presentation that pointed to the fact that the Justice Department recommended to Bank of America that they go talk to someone over at Booz Allen Hamilton, and that they would get them in touch with this other group of folks who would help them to, to get rid of their WikiLeaks problem. At that time, WikiLeaks had said that they were in the possession of a bunch of information from a major American banking institution that, that 
regularly committed malfeasance. Bank of America said, that's probably us. <laughs> and then, <laughs> so, so they actually contracted um, at some point to talk about how to undermine WikiLeaks. And one of the recommendations that I think is particularly um, uh, particularly of relevance for this audience is that they stated that they were going to try and undermine journalists that were supporting WikiLeaks and figured out ways that they can approach that. And so this example is a slide from this presentation deck about how they were going to target Glenn Greenwald because he was such an outspoken uh, supporter of WikiLeaks and has been from, from day one. And so these are established professionals that have a liberal bent, but ultimately most of them, if pushed, will choose professional preservation over cause, such as the mentality of most business professionals. Without the support of people like Glenn, WikiLeaks would fold. So, and Stephen Colbert does the penultimate send up of all of this. I highly recommend you go out and find, uh, just look up Colbert, HB Gary, it'll be your first, first one. It's one of the funniest, one of the funniest segments a while. He, he summarizes all of that very, very quickly. So, yeah, this kind of stuff's going on, apparently, um, within the cyber war defense industry area. Um, yeah. How much of, uh, of anonymous do you think could be a false flag at this point, or how much of a concern do you think that is? Um, well, go ahead and share, like, but I'm sure not everyone here knows what you mean by false flag. I'm just, you know, you, by nature, you don't know who Anonymous is. It could be that um, there was a period of like a month, not long ago, where there was just a, an unbelievable amount of hacking. It was kind of at, I think, after Lulsec had retired, even. So, but it was actually some of them too. So I just wonder at times whether or not it's people claiming it might be a corporation or a, somebody contracted by a corporation or even a, a state that's trying to make hacking look worse than it is or make Anonymous look irresponsible. In the case of like the the Bart thing, whenever somebody released all that personal information that was counter to um, any PR that Anonymous might want, but I mean I don't know if Anonymous, you know, that's the thing. So, oh, um, did you about? have? Yeah, I was just gonna say. Uh, speaking of that, I, I've heard some theories uh, that um, possibly even WikiLeaks could be a false flag. And false flag goes back it's a military term from the high seas where ships would fly. The flag of their own country and attack a different or attack their own country and basically it's a false flag operation. It would be the equivalent of a quote unquote inside job from a long, long, long time ago. So anyways, it's a term that the military uses. But anyways, uh, that WikiLeaks might have even WikiLeaks could be to shut down the internet and shut down freedom of speech. This is all just a theory that I've heard. Um, because when you look at a lot of the WikiLeaks stuff, you don't really see anything that's come out and just totally you know, shut down the military or, you know, really done a whole lot. So that could be kind of what he's talking about is that it could be something to set up uh, having internet controls and kill switches. And like what happened in BART, so they shut that down. You know, so it gives government public support to shut down these services. Uh, I think that those are actually very astute paths to, to go down and to explore. Uh, in the case of anonymous, it's it's almost well, it's, it's almost certain that there has to be some examples of that because the entire uh, the entire philosophy of anyone can be anonymous provides perfect cover to perpetrate any act that you really want to in front that any that any entity would want to act and say, well, it's anonymous. Right. It's like, oh, okay, well, I guess that's. Uh, I guess that's possible, but then you have to start looking at the actual, the actual incidents. And um, I wish I had one ready at hand where I could say, you know, that one. Actually, there is one. There was one. I haven't ever gone back to look at it that much, but there was one incident where someone released all of the emails from the Iranian visa uh, service. You know the, the the part of the Iranian government that handles visas for people right. wanting to come into the country, right. and so it released all the information for the month of May or something like that of everyone who had put in an application to go and 
to travel in Iran. I was like, well, who's interested in that information? You know, like, who, who, who would be interested in that? So, anyways, so who would be interested in this? This is from this last Thursday's release. Uh, so this is a Department of Public Safety, Texas Department of Public Safety Bureau of Information Analysis Situation Report from February 7th, 2008. It's marked law enforcement sensitive, which is fairly up there in the classification system. And it's just a report on Code Pink, the anti-war organization, saying that they are expanding their issues and now looking at uh, law enforcement deportation policies. There was a, a protest apparently planned um, at the Travis County Jail Oh, they were upset because Travis County Jail was providing office space to the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, the ICE folks, and that was seen as, you know, well, I don't know, that was seen. Anyways, it's rather curious that um, the DPS is gathering and distributing this information. Like, why? Why, why are we, are we back in, or did we ever leave? Uh, the 60s from when our, our governments were infiltrating our uh, groups for various reasons, I guess. Another example of a document release from the Anonymous that had sort of international repercussions. Um, this is from the Chingala Migra release. Um, there was a document within there this document, which indicated that the Arizona police force had information about the leader of the Sinaloa cartel, which is apparently the largest, uh, most powerful drug cartel in Mexico right now. And from what I've gathered, there's a little bit of questions about um, whether there's been some preferential treatment for the largest drug cartel in order to get everyone, all the other drug cartels to kill each other for the most part. And so I'm not really sure what that's all about. Anyhow, there's this information sharing agreement between the United States and several countries of Central America and Mexico called the Merida Initiative, which says that they're going to, in part, it says that they're going to be completely transparent and share information with one another um, in an effort to, to start stop narco trafficking. And uh, so apparently this was just straight up direct evidence that the United States was not living up to its end of the deal in that regard, as far as sharing information about the whereabouts of the head of the leading drug cartel. So um, that's interesting. It caused an action in the Senate in Mexico like several days later when this was found out, seeing that we needed to start this inquiry about uh, whether that was a breach of that agreement. So enough about anonymous and anti -sec. So let's real quickly go through the WikiLeaks stuff. Um, I wanted to just focus on stuff that's happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, and the best place to go for that is Nigel Perry. He's got a great write-up on the actual incident that occurred. Um, so. In this circumstance, just looking at our criteria, um, the secrecy level is mid-level classification. You're not seeing any top secret documents within there. You're seeing a handful, uh, well, a handful, I mean, a handful is 15,000 of uh, pretty high level um, stuff. The rest of the stuff, some of it's just not even classified at all. Um, quantity, you know, there's, there's a lot. It's a lot of information. The oldest cable dates back to 1966. There's only a handful, like between 1966 and early 2000s. Uh, but that's a lot of information. Very, very dense information, and it's really actually interesting. You know, it's it's the story of geopolitical history, really, for the last decade. You're you're getting information not only about the United States government's perceptions but you're getting accurate information about um, the, um, the, the 
the activities and actions of other governments all around the world, every government that we're interacting with. Um, these cables are from all across the entire planet, from our, our, our embassies all around the world. So um, it's, it's fascinating information, um, but it's also incredibly dense, you know. If you're not a subject matter expert in these domains, it's, it's, it's kind of boring, you know, you're reading all of this intimate detail about um, these events that have occurred and such, but um, it's only so parsable, you know, it takes, a, it takes an actual subject matter expert, a journalist, to provide that context. And so that's what they've been trying to figure out how to do, is how to strike that balance between the anonymous approach of just, here it is, and the approaches kind of that WikiLeaks, have, or the, the approaches of the investigative journalist of actually trying to not only get the information, but to contextualize it, to present it for people to understand. So um, towards that end, there have been a lot of tools that have been developed specifically around the cables. I can share a few of those with you. Um, and as far as the intentionality, um, again, it's getting to your question about whether it's a false flag or not. You know, allegedly, it's an act of whistleblowing. Um, if it wasn't, it's been one of the most remarkable strokes of uh, uh, diplomatic genius that we've ever seen. Seeing as how you know the entire Middle East has changed, adjusted, although maybe not necessarily for the United States' long-term interest. And so, but this most recent release, which occurred in the last several weeks, is all the result really of kind of a combination of human error and human and these sorts of things. So what happened is that, well, what happened is all the cables were released. WikiLeaks has been going through this process of just doling them out very slowly in cooperation with their media partners. Uh, at this point, um, you know, they started off with four or five mainstream media partners, uh, the New York, New York Times, El País in Spain, uh, Der Spiegel in Germany, um, Guardian in England, and I'm missing one, but it come to me. So, uh, but they have many, many more media partners that they've established since then. Um, it's up to 90 uh, different media partners, um, varying in size and scope around the world, um, focusing on different regions and such. And so it's been very exciting to see all of that slowly, slowly emerge. Um, but then something happened um, in late August, best I can tell is WikiLeaks or Julian Assange, the, the nominal head of the organization, um, received word that the what's the proper term? The grand jury? I'm not sure. Um, uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, that's investigating ways to possibly tie or possibly implicate WikiLeaks in, a, in an espionage case, um, that they are continuing their efforts and they got word somehow or another that the efforts are continuing and I think that, that made them increase the rate at which they were actually releasing cables. Um, and so in the matter of four or five days there, um, they released about 100,000 cables where up to that point from November 28th through August, they had released 20,000 in total of the 251,000. And then all of a sudden there was this burst of 100,000 new additional cables. And it seemed like it was predicated just by finding out that there was that additional information, like the, the pressure was, was come on that somehow or another they responded to it like that. So right after that, um, it came basically well, there's this entire drama around this fellow, Daniel Domscheitberg, who formerly worked with WikiLeaks, then got tired of working with them, and he left, and he took the entire source code to the platform, as well as a lot of the information with him, and said he was going to start his own thing, and he kept on saying he was going to start his own thing, and he's going to write a, he wrote a book about it, and then everyone's like, okay, well, no, no, still nothing. And so this guy apparently is just so suspect that um, he 
kind of helped the world put two and two together as far as the fact that a Guardian journalist who was one of the first people working with Assange um, had published this password to the files under the assumption that, well, no one's going to ever have the files, I guess. I mean, I don't really know what the hell this guy was thinking, publishing in a book that he wrote about it all in the span of three weeks, apparently, and has already sold the movie rights to, um, that he thought it was good operational security, I guess, to just go ahead and publish the password in this book that's all around the world. And so it came out that apparently a copy of those files had been distributed for some period of time in the, the mirrors. Like uh, WikiLeaks on November 28th, when they were starting to to do the Cablegate release, they came under a denial of service attack from uh, one of these folks like the, the anti lulsec people, this guy called the Jester, and he shut down their site. And then, um, wait, what the hell did that have to do with anything? Shit, totally forgot. So, <laughs> going back. So apparently, as a result of the challenges that WikiLeaks has faced, they've had to figure out ways to actually stay active and online and available for people to see. And so they've been mirroring their entire site structure to people and allowing them to, to replicate the site uh, in different locations on the internet. So. Uh, that's the that's the A number one way to ensure the um, safety of information is to replicate it uh, no matter what. So apparently in this mirror file that was sent around at some period of time, it included that actual compressed and um, password protected file. Uh, it was actually encrypted. Uh, was this form. the insurance file? It was not. Okay. The insurance file was released at like early December or something like that. And we still don't know that. Is. Still not sure exactly what's in there. Um, so, but this was a, a separate file. It was in a hidden directory. I think actually that's the way they transferred it to some people. They just didn't remove it for a time. And so it was out there in the wild. And so, long story short, Daniel Domchak Berg says, you know, the password's out there in a very obvious source to this file. And in a matter of 24 hours, uh, folks had decrypted it and it was out in the wild. Um, 24 hours after that, WikiLeaks made the decision to formally release everything. And so that's how this story got so kind of complicated and convoluted. It was like they were actually responding to a data breach that was unintentional, uh, loser error, so to speak, and um, completely, basically made possible by Guardian journals. Here's a good resource to use if you're interested in looking at the slides, uh, cablegatesearch.net. Um, there's also another site called cabledrum.net. Both of them provide full text search and scanning through on the different tags that are used uh, on these cables. Uh, the cables are very, um, pretty complicated uh, as far as it's understanding the, the taxonomy of tags and such that are used. So um, resources like this make it very possible to just go in there and search across everything if you're interested in a certain thing. So that's what I've actually prepared formally to, to present. Um, we're at 45 minutes or so now or something like that. We're more like an hour. <laughs> and so um, these are just a couple of suggested areas that we could dive in deeper if y'all are interested in talking some more about this.